Well, hi everyone, and welcome to Elbow Lake Environmental Education Center's fourth virtual public outreach event for the summer of 2020. We're very excited to have you all with us for the Species at Risk Lending a Helping Hand webinar with James Paget from the Canadian Wildlife Federation. We will be hosting virtual outreach events bi-weekly this summer, so please stay tuned on Elbow Lake Environmental Education Center's website and social media. My name is Megan White, and I'm one of the Outreach and Stewardship interns at the Queen's University Biological Station. Myself, along with Lindsay Ray, the other Outreach and Stewardship intern, and Sarah Oldenberger, the Outreach and Teaching Coordinator, will be facilitating this session tonight. We ask that you please keep your audio and video turned off throughout the webinar and type your questions into the chat box. The chat icon is located at the bottom of the Zoom window. We will be monitoring the chat box throughout the presentation and we will have a question and answer period about halfway through and at the end of the presentation. Please note that we will also be recording this webinar, and so if you have to leave early or you wish to share it with your networks, it will be available on the official CUBE's YouTube channel afterwards. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the territory that we are thankful to be situated on. Queen's University is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. Specifically, the Elbow Lake Environmental Education Center is situated on unceded Algonquin territory and is part of the Algonquin land claim by the Algonquins of Ontario, currently under negotiation with the federal government of Canada. Acknowledgement of these facts requires recognition of the pre-colonial history of the land and the peoples who lived here and continue to live here. The cultures and spiritualities of indigenous peoples are connected to the land and the land is an integral part of their ways of knowing and living. These knowledge systems are continually evolving in relation to the land and its other inhabitants, both human and other than human. The Kingston Indigenous community continues to reflect the area's Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee roots. There is also a significant Métis community and there are first peoples from other nations across Turtle Island present here today. I'd like to take this time to welcome and introduce our speaker for this evening. James leads the Canadian Wildlife Federation's initiatives on species at risk conservation, as well as CWF's involvement with provincial and, and federal governments with respect to endangered species protection. He works on various species at risk and biodiversity projects at CWF, including turtle recovery work, rare species surveys, bat recovery, and citizen science. Working with the folks at iNaturalist.org, James has also been the lead at CWF in the creation of iNaturalist.ca, along with partners at the Royal Ontario Museum, Parks Canada, and Nature Surf Canada. James, we are very excited to learn from you, and I'll pass it along to you now. Thanks, Megan. Um, thanks everyone for joining in. I'm happy to be here to, to chat with everybody virtually. So uh, yeah, as much as it's difficult to um, not be able to be in person in places it actually gives uh, us an opportunity to connect from maybe further afield that we otherwise might not have actually been able to, to have this. So this has been, um, you know, a bit of a silver lining sometimes in this. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen here and get started. Okay, so um, yeah, as Megan mentioned, I'm with Canadian Wildlife Federation. Um, we have a um, number of, I'm, I work on the conservation science team. We have a number of other uh, departments, including um, an education presence as well as communications. But uh, I'm going to speak to you specifically with uh, about some of the work that I do uh, on the conservation science side of things. Um, within this, we have we do some work on, on freshwater conservation, uh, fish habitat protection, some fish passage work. Um, and by myself, I'm more of a terrestrial person, so I'm uh, gonna sp speak more on the terrestrial side of things in a bit. Uh, marine conservation as well, um, working on uh, a lot on the East Coast, but as well as the West Coast on um, entanglement issues and um, engagement, public engagement stuff as well. And then the terrestrial side of things, um, we're working on agricultural lands in uh, migratory bird conservation and uh, with the um, work on the boreal forest. And now more of what I do is the citizen science side of things, uh, as I mentioned, uh, as Megan mentioned, um, the iNaturalist engagement, but also tying into bio blitzes, um, as well as just engagement on everyday people reporting things that, uh, that we're seeing in the wild. And a big focus is what I'm gonna talk about Today in these last of but these last two slides is the Endangered Species Program, uh, which I, I lead here at Canadian Wildlife Federation. So there are um, about 829 species at risk in Canada. Uh, I know often 
depending on, on our knowledge of species at risk, often people think about um, you know, things farther away, but we have quite a few um, within our own borders. Um, and uh, some are at various higher levels of endangerment than others, but we have about 800 and almost 830. And of these, about 670 have actually made it onto the federal species at risk list. Um, the discrepancy is because, so basically there's a scientific um, community that, uh, or committee that assesses the status of species in Canada. They provide that assessment to the federal government and the federal government then um, decides and takes the next step to actually list the species under the Federal Species at Risk Act. Um, now the Federal Species at Risk Act is kind of an overarching um, guide uh, applying across the country, um, but every province as well has, uh, is supposed to have com some legislation and, and measures to protect species on, on non-federal land, so kind of what's more in the provincial jurisdiction. Um, now the, what happens when once a species gets listed um, is it is added to the Federal Act um, and then uh, it triggers the need for a recovery strategy to be, cre uh, to be created, which is basically outlines the steps that are need to be taken in order to uh, recover the species to its you know, previous endangered state. Um, part of that, which is a really important part, is um, within that it identifies what's considered the critical habitat of the species. So this is the really essential parts of the habitat that these species, and it's, it's species by species, so it's very catered to the ind individual, um, what it needs and really requires to, um, to recover, survive and recover in the wild. Um, so there's also, as I mentioned, the, the provinces play a role and in, in Ontario, which I think most um, people on this webinar are listening in from, um, there's the Provincial Endangered Species Act. Um, now there's a whole lot of nuances about how well or not well the federal and provincial act um, what kind of a job it does at, at protecting species. Um, I'm not really going to get into all that right now. I'm just going to kind of talk about um, what the threats are to species, what we're doing, and what, what kind of everybody uh, can keep in mind and what we can all think about doing as far as helping uh, some of these species recover. Uh, my slides are frozen. Um, there we go. So um, the threats, there's a number, it depends on the species. Um, there are a number of threats and some species are just, were never common in Canada to begin with. So they're considered, you know, rare and endangered. Um, but for a lot of them, the threats kind of boil down to a common thing, which is us, essentially. Um, habitat loss is a large one. Um, impacts from our activity, whether it's uh, industry or roads or shipping um, or um, climate change is another threat that's more and more uh, realistic for actually causing or being linked to a threat to for species at risk. Um, and I think this, this slide kind of outlines it well. So on the left we have the um, kind of hot spots of where uh, species at risk are found. Um, so the reds are, you know, kind of more numbers, more concentrations of, of uh, endangered species. And on the right, we also see the kind of more intensive uh, land use of human land use. So the dark kind of the pinkish and green are the more intense um, areas of human impact, which these two maps line up pretty well. Now, can't say that one's causing the other necessarily, but um, because the southern areas of Canada tend to be more habitable to both people and wildlife, so there's that factor, but um, it's quite an overlap. For the, whether it's a cause of humans or just coincidence, I'm sure it's not just coincidence, um, but um, regardless, it shows we have a big role to play. So speaking of that role, uh, I'm gonna talk about what some of the stuff that uh, CWF is doing. Um, as I mentioned, I'm more on the terrestrial side of things, so I'm gonna talk about these three on the left more so. Um, so talking a little bit about some of our, our bat recovery work, um, uh, at-risk at turtle work, some monarch stuff, which is included with uh, restoration of pollinator habitat. Um, but on the other side, there's also, um, the top right is actually an American eel. Uh, we have those in the Ottawa River and the St. Lawrence River. Um, and we've been uh, carrying out a tagging 
project to determine the movement patterns of eels in the Ottawa River for the last uh, four or so years. Um, as well, we um, lead the uh, Canadian Marine Animal Response Alliance, um, which is basically uh, a response for when animals, uh, marine mammals, uh, get uh, often caught up in fishing gear or uh, stranded. Um, there's a network of organizations that uh, will respond to that. One of the other things combined with that is we're actually working on um, developing with uh, other researchers developing uh, ropeless fishing gear for um, fisher, fishers to um, ensure that whales and other large mammals don't get tangled up in the first place. Um, so I'll start off with bats. Um, bats are often a misunderstood animal, uh, maybe one of the most misunderstood, especially mammals uh, we have in Canada. Um, they're pretty cool. They're the only mammal that flies, for one thing. Um, and they are one of the most abundant um, mammals in the world. There's over 1,300 different species of bat, and they span the globe. But this distribution is where um, bats have been known to, to occur, and they live, they're found on every continent except uh, Antarctica. So that's, uh, that's uh, I think, something bats can claim that most mammals cannot. Uh, in Canada, we have 19 different species of bats. Ontario, we have about seven. Um, so we have a very small portion of the global um, pop or distribution of bats, but they're still extremely important nonetheless. Um, bats, for one, eat a ton of um, bite flying insects, including mosquitoes. So they can eat uh, pretty much their body weight uh, in mosquitoes or in insects in a, sing in a single mite. So if you have a population of bats, that's really doing a lot for insect control. Uh, and they also provide um, millions and millions of dollars in uh, pest control for agricultural producers. But they are threatened, um, and so three species in particular are most hard hit by this disease called white nose syndrome. White nose, because as you can see in the photo, um, it's basically a fungus that um, uh, develops on the bat and is most visible on the nose and wings. Um, and it was introduced from, uh, we figure Europe, introduced into the United States from people who had visited caves there and brought the fungus here. And our Canadian bats just aren't adapted to handle this, this kind of novel disease. Um, interesting, we're talking about disease in bats uh, with all this uh, social distancing and the situation we're in now. Um, we actually, bats in Canada do not carry the COVID-19 and we're trying to really hard to make it, make it stay that way. So um, the real risk right now is research on bats is for the most part on hold, except for real critical research that's happening under strict protocols with proper protective equipment, basically to protect the bats from us. We don't want to in introduce any new disease into the bat populations in Canada, especially ones that are already hard hit by this white nose syndrome. So it's kind of a reverse of thinking where we're concerned more people giving something to bats rather than the other way around. But on top of this white nose syndrome, there's a few other threats. White nose syndrome is the largest and it's, it's decimated some populations by like 95%. Um, but what we're working to do is to try and alleviate all, any other threats. So the bats that do survive, how can we make sure those ones stay alive? Um, so additional threats are habitat loss, as I mentioned with a number of species, that's, that's a common thread, um, but also uh, evictions or removal from buildings if it's done in an improper way. I know sometimes it does have to happen, but if it happens at the wrong time of year um, or the wrong way, if it's just sealed up and the bats are trapped in the house, then we're essentially locking them in and they, they won't survive. If it's done at the wrong time of year, which is pretty much starting now uh, and actually earlier last month, earlier in June, um, any maternity roost, so if there's pups inside, the mothers will leave and then the pups are trapped inside. So it's basically done with a one-way door, the mothers leave, they can't get back in, and then the pups are trapped inside and they end up dying in the house. So um, an additional threat. And then there's also um, agricultural practices that use pesticides, which contaminate um, the food source of bats, but also kill and reduce a lot of that, a lot of that source. Um, and wind turbines, which is there in the background, um, wind turbines kill uh, a significantly higher number of bats than people would often think. It's, uh, we often think of bird collisions, but bats are actually higher in many areas um, of being killed by wind turbines. So what we've been looking at is one of the, of the eviction, the removal of bats from houses as one of our um, 
uh, aspects that we're working on. So we actually had a house south of Ottawa that had bats in it and they had called a wildlife control company to remove the bats humanely. So as I was mentioning, the one-way door, the bats can leave and they can't get back in. But what we wanted to know is what is the impact to the bats when this happens? Um, do they just leave somewhere and go somewhere else? Do they die as a result of this eviction? Um, it's been looked at a little bit, but not, not really um, in depth, especially not here in Canada. So we set up these nets basically before dusk, um, and then bats would fly out of the um, fly out of the attic of this home. They weren't in the living space; they were all in the attic. Um, and we caught a number of the bats, and um, then glued really little receivers to the back of these bats. Um, and remember, this is all before COVID, so we didn't have uh, we had protective gear, which you see with gloves. We didn't have the the N95 masks and all that, which researchers would need to have right now to work on bats. Um, so we glue these like, little transmitters to the bats and put an armband on them and then we let them go and we figure out where they where they go where do they go when they can't get back in this house um, by figuring out where they go so this this little uh, receiver that we glued to the back we, we had six bats that we glued these two and it, it's these are study methods that have been proven they don't hurt the bat the receiver is with uh, surgical glue that falls off in about uh, 14 days um, and bats are okay after the fact um, we use a, an antenna to pick up the, um, the signal of the receiver and we can kind of pinpoint where they go. So at the same time of this, we put up a bat box, which you can see in the picture on the right, um, at the site where they had been coming out of to give them a new spot to go to, to see if they will use the bat house and to provide some extra shelter for the bats. So day one, the bats all on the top, top left actually went right back and didn't get into the house because they couldn't, but they kind of uh, roosted in the, in the crevice there. The second day they hadn't gone back there, they had all found another spot to go to. None of them had used our bat house during the entirety of the study, um, but uh, so the 14 days of the track, the, the transmitters were active, but um, uh, about a month later, I did go back and check on it and two bats were using it. So um, already within a couple of months, um, bats were in, in the bat box. Where do they mostly go? Well, um, most of them went to the neighbors <laughs> and all within about 300 meters of the original house. And we're thinking they probably already knew these sites um, and just couldn't get back to their, their main one, which was in this house, and just went to their secondary sites that they knew about. Um, two of them though, flew about two and a half kilometers away, um, which is the red line and then the black line of where and when they left the house. Um, and, um, that's pretty far movement for these are all big brown bats um for like a single night i mean they'll fly farther away for hibernation but um it's quite a distance for them to go just for a new roost site so that was some interesting findings the other aspect of the uh, the bats project is um these bat boxes so we provided a bunch of them in the ottawa area uh, and we have designs and plans for people to build their own if they like uh, on helpthebats.ca so we have designs of how to build it. We have um, the uh, kind of steps at how to put it up and where to put it up, as well as a monitoring protocol so it's, uh, people can report on the use of the bat boxes. What we're looking to do with that is pool all the information, all these, these different sizes and dimensions and, and styles of bat boxes to see if we can determine are there some that bats seem to like more than others. So we're trying to basically find the optimal design of bat boxes. So this is where we're trying to help are trying to engage everyday people as citizen scientists to um, to monitor these bat boxes and, and contribute to the science and on um, whether they're being used or not. Um, other things we can do for bats in particular and in general as well is reduce or um, avoid entirely the use of pesticides, which as I mentioned with agriculture, the same as with our yards, um, it reduces the food source for bats, but as well, um, those that don't die can contaminate the food that the bats then eat. Uh, and if it's possible to leave wildlife trees like this um, on properties or on the you know, tree line to provide other cavities for bats to be nesting in. Um, I'm gonna move from bats now to something a little closer to the ground um, and talk about our turtle work. Um, so as well, we have a website, helptheturtles.ca, just like the bats. Um, and there are um, eight species of turtle in Canada and all of them uh, are at some level of endangerment. So there's three kind of levels of like, let's say bad to worse. So um, there's special concern, which is something, a species that we're just kind of, we, uh, the scientific community is keeping an eye on. 
uh, then threatened, and then endangered is basically the worst case for um, a species before it goes extinct. Um, so all turtles are at some level, one of these three levels. And again, the threat is uh, habitat loss is a, is a large one, but also road mortality. Um, and we've put road networks in, in a lot of areas, um, as you see habitat loss. Um, over the years, you can see the increase in density of roads um, around uh, eastern, southern and eastern Ontario. Um, the turtles do move outside of the uh, wetlands and often have to travel across roads. And in the last two years or three years of, of our um, road mortality surveys, so we're just driving roads to find turtles on roads, we found over uh, 1,400 turtles that have been killed on roads in just three seasons alone. So it is a real threat and we're seeing that. So what we're doing is we were working in the Ottawa area as well as partnering with Scales Nature Park that is in uh, Muskoka area. Uh, and our idea is to find new locations of Blanding's turtle, which is, as I mentioned earlier on, about the critical habitat and protected habitat. Blanding's turtles have critical or have pr protected habitat in Ontario in particular as well. Um, that um, a uh, an observation or an occurrence that can be documented of a Blanding's turtle will actually protect about up to two kilometers of the wetland around that around that occurrence. So we're trying to find as many uh, Blanding's turtle occurrences as, as we can to then provide for habitat um, protection. We're also looking to find uh, hotspots, so basically concentrations of where turtles are more often getting hit on roads to help and plan for mitigation, which would be some fencing to keep the turtles off the road and direct them instead to a culvert that goes underneath. An additional activity we're doing as well has been um, saving what we're calling high-risk nests. So turtles that lay um, say too close to the road that are gonna end up getting run over by cars or in really high predation areas by some raccoons and skunks will often dig up uh, turtle nests. Um, so we're finding these turtle nests, we're digging them up, which we have permits for, um, and bringing them back and incubating them at, uh, at a facility. So on the right is our CWF uh, incubator, but then on the left, bottom left is the um, scales, which is a much larger initiative than, uh, as far as incubation goes, than, than we have. So um, basically the turtles are kept in these uh, controlled environments, and then when they hatch, we're releasing them into the wild back from where we, um, where we excavated the nest from. So we, we track every single nest and they, the, the hatchlings go right back to the site where they were laid. So since 2017, we've released, uh, we and I should say Scales Nature Park has done the, the major um, numbers in this, in this, but over 36,000 hatchlings um, released into the wild. So it would give them a bit of a head start. So they're not ones, these are nests that would likely have been predated or um, um, impacted by vehicles or other. Um, so more road mortality um, is the other um, threat that we're working on. Um, and the map on the left are all points of turtles that we have found uh, in the Ottawa area in the last two to three years um, uh, that are dead on the road. It's a scary map to look at with this number of turtles, but the, the kind of upshot of this is we're trying to translate these um, observations into con conservation. So we're, we're looking at uh, analysis of these spots to find out where the areas are that turtles are most often getting hit. And we were able to work with uh, the Minister of Transport in Ontario and got our two worst hotspots fenced just last year to prevent them turtles from coming onto the road. And we're working on more to come. So every year we're looking at uh, targeting at least one more hotspot for mitigation in uh, Eastern Ontario. Um, and one other uh, uh, recovery work uh, that I want to talk about is uh, our habitat restoration pro uh, project. Um, so uh, monarch butterflies are also uh, listed as endangered or assessed as endangered. They're still awaiting the actual listing. Um, so basically their populations have declined over the last decades. Um, a lot of it due to habitat loss. A lot of the habitat loss is actually uh, their overwintering sites in Mexico, but as well as their migration routes back up through the United States um, of habitat that has been converted from um, uh, wildflower uh, meadows into corn fields or other agricultural crops. But we have a share of that to, to 
um, hold on our shoulders here in Canada as well. So there's a lot of land conversion that's happening. And um, up until very recently, actually, um, the uh, milkweed plant, which is the primary host um, that, or primary plant that the monarch butterfly requires, the caterpillar exclusively feeds on, monarch, uh, on milkweed. So adult monarchs will lay their eggs specifically on milkweed and um, the caterpillars eat the milkweed. And so I was gonna say, it's in, as up until very recently, uh, milkweed was on the noxious weed list in Ontario and many other provinces. So it was actually at one point kind of illegal to not remove milkweed from uh, pasture land. So that's been changed and uh, I think enough sensitization has happened that uh, people are realizing the, realizing the, the re requirement and the obligation that monarchs require for milkweed so are, are looking to maintain that more. Um, so what we're looking to do is, is target these, what we're calling rights of way. So roadsides, these kind of linear corridors to convert them from um, mode areas or treated areas into um, kind of a more of a landscape style habitat. Um, and there are areas that can, can lend themselves well to this. For one, it provides kind of a linear corridor for, mar for monarchs and other pollinators to travel along, but it also uh, reduces the cost to the um, in municipality or whoever's managing that land to um, have to mow less frequently. So there's a cost savings as well as a conservation benefit. Um, so a, a pilot project that we've launched uh, in the Ottawa area, we were um, work working on restoring about five hectares of habitat. Um, and we've carried out a uh, workshop um, face to face before, uh, well, we still could go face to face, so not too long ago, but um, for uh, rights of way managers, so city managers and others. Um, and we've also had a webinar series on uh, habitat restoration, specifically kind of the larger scale end of things. Um, so kind of what, how that works is, as you're looking on the right side of the, the top photo, um, so it starts by the site prep and then hand seeding, rolling it in to make sure that the seeds are, are packed in well. Um, and the end result is what we're looking at at the bottom, ideally, um, on the left, and I'm thinking that this kind of pie chart on the bottom um, is kind of the, the results to look at. So the bright orange uh, on the bottom left one is our, um, the non-native grasses. So this is before doing any work on it. And then we've reduced that, I think at the right, a year later, to have a much larger number of native flowering plants and reduce the number of non-native grasses. So basically things that would have otherwise just been mowed over and have to be mowed, you know, once a month or, uh, or every couple of months uh, throughout the summer period. Now, if we're looking to leave this as, as um, native um, plants and wildflowers, it requires less mowing maybe once a year. Um, so it's a, you know, it's a pilot project. We're looking at whether this can be done on a large scale and there's other organizations that have done this on a much larger scale. So we know it's doable um, and it just kind of requires a, a change of mindset to think of these linear roadside areas to go from um, kind of mode areas and maintained into more of a naturalized state. Um, and this was in particular talking about kind of these larger areas, but this is something that can be thought of on a smaller scale in our own yards, which I'll kind of talk about at the end of wrapping it all up of uh, you know things that we can all do um, to think about um, for conservation. Uh, I'm gonna give it a bit of a pause here. It's about halfway mark, a little bit more, I think, um, to see if there are any questions that, um, we can, uh, that I can address. I'm sure it's a pretty quick, uh, quick run through that I've just thrown at everybody, so. Awesome. Thanks so much, James. Um, I have one question so far, but just a reminder to everyone, if you have any questions, feel free to type them into the chat box. Um, our first question is, what is the typical percentage of turtles that die off due to winter kill each year? Due to winter kill? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure what that means by winter. Like, so the turtles will overwinter in the wetlands below the freezing point. Um, I think, I mean, I don't know what percentage survive versus don't survive over the winter. I think the majority of them do. I mean, uh, it depends on the age of the turtle. Um, mortality is pretty high for the juveniles and hatchlings. So even these little ones that we're releasing, um, I think there's something like roughly 1% uh, 
uh, of turtles go and make it from hatchling to to grow up to the point where they're old enough to reproduce. Um, but for turtles, one of the threats is that um, it takes them up to you know 15 to 25 years, depending on the species, before they reach maturity to reproduce. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong in those first 25 years before a turtle is old enough to kind of contribute back to the population. So we're really looking to help um, conserve the adults that are already also already reproducing. Um, just a clarification on what they meant by winter kill. Um, they mentioned that it would be a lack of oxygen due to deep, too deep of a freeze. Do you know much about that? Mm. Yeah, I honestly don't know um, much of that. I do know that that is, that is something that can happen. Um, uh, but I, I didn't really don't know the percentages of what that would be. That's okay. Thank you. Um, another question, the maps that you said earlier about species at risk and then the comparison to the human use of land, I think it was one of the first slides. Um, someone noticed that PEI was red for heavily settled, but appeared to have less or lo a lower density of species at risk. And they were just wondering if you had any insights about that. Hmm. It just really depends, I think, on where the, the species at risk are found. Um, I say they kind of tend to line up with where the heavily populated areas are, but it's not, um, you know, it's not exact, cut and dry. Um, the, um, I mean, PEI isn't a highly populated area necessarily. It's a pretty uh, um, spread out province. So, um, yeah, I think it's just a factor that um, things don't always line up exactly that way. Makes sense. Thank you. Um, someone else just wanted to let you know that they saw two monarchs yesterday in Kempville or in Nova Scotia. Sorry, um, because there's lots of milkweed nearby, so it's very exciting. Awesome. Yeah, they're just starting to make their way back. I haven't seen any here at my place, but I tend to most summers, so they should be around pretty soon. If and already in some places, obviously. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so yeah, definitely. Um, so I, I note on that, if, especially seeing the milkweed. Um, to keep in mind that as we're mowing or weed eating around our house, if you're cutting down milkweed plants, um, which are often kind of really growing on the edges, uh, be good idea for one to not, but if you really need to, to check the, the leaves, the underside to see if there are caterpillars on it, because I, I'm sure some people are mowing them over without realizing it. And I think if, if people thought about it and, and knew that there were potential monarch caterpillars on milkweed, they, they would leave it alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good to keep in mind. Thank you. Um, someone else is wondering if it would be feasible for roadway verges, so along highways or between lanes of traffic, to be naturalized with monarch-friendly species. If where, sorry, along roadways? Yeah, like um, along highways or between lanes of traffic. Yeah, uh, there's different thinking on that too, and, and I, I, there's a concern potentially that it's creating an area to attract pollinators that then um, are hit by vehicles that are going by. Um, some studies have been looking into that and the general consensus is that the benefits outweigh the potential impacts. So um, if we have enough habitat, it's gonna create a net benefit of, of pollinators. So eventually we'll have more than what are actually killed on roads. Um, so yeah, in, definitely in the center lanes of, of roads is, some, is somewhere to consider. That'd be really cool. Um, mm -hmm. Someone else was mentioning that the work you're doing is quite impressive. So thank you for all that you are doing. Um, and they were wondering if your location data would make its way into the Ontario's natural heritage system um, for use by Cosero. I'm not too sure what Cosero is, but maybe. Yeah. Yeah, so Cosero, so I was talking about a scientific or a, a panel of experts that assess species status. And in Canada, there's a, there's a nation or a national uh, committee that's called CASIWIC, with a committee on the status of endangered wildlife in Canada. And in Ontario, there's an, also a committee specific to Ontario, which is Casero, that does the assessments on species at risk. And yes, our, our information does go through to the Natural Heritage Information Center um, in Ontario and, and the other provinces. And actually, I'm going to touch on that a little bit um, when I talk next about citizen science and iNaturalist and, and how we can all contribute. Um, and the data that then does all this data goes to these uh, provincial conservation data centers like the Natural Heritage Information Center. That's awesome. Cool. Um, one more question that I see is what percentage of monarch caterpillars make it to butterflies or make it to a butterfly? Mm, that's a good question. I don't honestly know. Um, 
I assume like generally with species, so monarchs will lay, uh, well, there's multiple generations that would happen in Canada as well before they head back to um, overwinter. Um, and they will lay, you know, a number of eggs on a single milkweed plant. And typically in nature, um, species that lay a lot of individuals know that a lot of them won't make it. So similar with turtles, like a snapping turtle nest could have upwards of, well, our largest one, I think we had 65 uh, eggs in it. Um, so the, the strategy is that if you lay a lot and a lot are going to not make it, well, some of them will. So similar to that, probably monarchs who laid a number of eggs on a single plant, um, the percentage is pretty, pretty low. Um, so um, something that people can do, and it's something great to do with kids, is um, you can actually bring them, uh, uh, take them off the plant or cut the, the leaf and, and raise the caterpillar uh, into a butterfly, which we've done. Um, something to bear in mind though, something just, just recently studied was that if it's done, especially the last generation before the migration, which would be kind of towards the end of the summer, if that's done inside in a house, um, it throws off their um, migration sense. So they actually can't find their way back as easily down to Mexico. So something to bear in mind if you're doing it later in the summer, if you keep them in a terrarium or something outside on a deck or something like that, um, sheltered from the elements, um, it's much better to do that way. Awesome. Um, I think I have two more questions so far. So the first one, in case of a gray rat snake swallowing a five-line skink, whose side does one take? Uh, so I heard the first part. In the case of that, what was the... Sorry. In case of a gray rat snake swallowing a five-lined skink, whose side does one take? <laughs> That's a good question. Both are a risk. <laughs> um, depends on where, because uh, the five-line skink population in uh, sort of the more northern on the Canadian Shield area is a special concern species, and a gray rat snake are threatened, so I'd say they're more at risk. <laughs> so I would say the gray rat snake um, should take precedence, but uh, it is it is does outline a uh, conundrum in conservation science that some like some endangered species eat others. Um, and that's a real concern. There's a, there's a situation with the um, black-footed ferret in the prairies and its prey species is the um, black-tailed prairie dog. The ferrets were reintroduced into an area, but the prairie dog population was also at risk um, and had to be built up before the ferrets could be introduced. And it's like, how do you balance the conservation benefit of one species over another when one preys on the other? So it is a fine balance and, and shows how complex nature is when we try and uh, try and recreate or, or play with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, population dynamics are definitely really interesting. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And then the last question that I have so far um, is the collage in the background of the slide. Is that from Ontario or Canada? And where did you get that collage? Uh, good question. So these are um, across the country. And these are all species at risk at some level of endangerment. Um, and I've, I've taken this collage mostly from my naturalist pictures. So our naturalist um, platform is what I'll actually talk about next. So it's a good segue. Um, there are photo uh, collage that I pulled off that off that website. And uh, there's a way to search for threatened species. And we're actually updating that a bit because right now, what we check for threatened on our naturalist Canada isn't all just endangered species in Canada. It's kind of using the uh, more of an international standard for what's threatened. So some of which are actually not threatened in Canada. Um, so we're working to update the system so that it actually truly shows the species that are listed uh, as species at risk in, in this country. Awesome. Uh, a few more questions have slid through. Um, one of them I missed, so I'm sorry about that. Um, but someone was mentioning that they've had milkweed in their garden for about four years um, and that it's growing each year. Um, and they, but they don't have any sign of monarch caterpillars and they're wondering if there's any reason for them not coming to their milkweed garden. But they do have- Yeah, it's a good- So just not- Yeah. Like so yeah, it's a good question. Um, it kind of depends if they find it or not. Um, there's, you know, depends if they're coming through and they find the patch. Um, we were literally had about three plants um, on the side of our property and um, we had four or five caterpillars on that. Um, but it's, you know, we could have a big patch and they're not finding it. It really just depends if the, the monarch itself gets to that patch and, and finds it. I mean, they are pretty hard to find the caterpillars, especially when they're really young um, to find them. So the basically kind of, best way is to check to see if the leaf looks like it's been eaten a little bit, 
check the undersides and see if they're the caterpillars are there because the other thing is birds and other um, predators will get them as well. So even if they're um, not there, maybe they were at one point and they just, they maybe have gotten snatched up by birds. Um, a few more milkweed questions. Can you clarify that it is common milkweed that you're referring to? Yes, so um, butterfly or monarch butterflies aren't specific to which milkweed. So there's a number of milkweed species. So the common milkweed is the one we most people would have. It's the tall one um, that has these big pods in the in the fall or late summer. Um, that's the common milkweed. There's also swamp milkweed. There's butterfly weed. Um, there's an, an endangered milkweed plant that's only found in a, one spot in Ontario. Um, so there's and monarchs will use any one of those milkweed plants. Um, but the one that was listed as a as a noxious weed in Ontario and a few other provinces, I think, was specifically the the common milkweed. Thank you for that clarification. Um, another person was wondering if you had any success, or sorry, if you had any tips for successfully growing milkweed from seed. I don't. Um, I think it grows well generally. Um, uh, so if you can find seed somewhere, which is, you know, it's pretty obvious to find the pods, um, you can you can kind of propagate it. Um, some species need like an overwintering first. So if they would need to be out in the cold for the first winter and then they'll germinate in the spring. So probably best to try and plant them or, or pack them into the ground a little bit in the in the fall. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know, like they, sh they produce enough seed that, that uh, some of them should take uh, if you get them in the ground. Thank you. Um, another question, why are there more snakes and rabbits this year and turtles too, at least on Lower Beverly Lake? <laughs> um, don't know. Um, there, it's, it's interesting. So we've, we've kind of thought about this phenomenon of, of right now with people being, or less now, but originally with people in isolation, um, there's been these reports of more species being seen in either odd places or more frequently. Um, I'm not sure if it's, I think it's a bit of two things. I think it's one that people are home and looking at their windows and noticing what's around because we are home and we're, we're working I'm in front of my window when I work. Um, but I think it may also be, so there's that, but I think there may be situations where species are um, with traffic that had been decreased with people out not uh, out and about a little bit less that uh, species were um, less frightened off and kind of coming out of their secluded spots that we're maybe seeing them more often. Cool. I've got one more question and then perhaps we can move on with the presentation. Um, but someone was wondering if you could comment on the dog strangling vine, which is a relative of milkweed, um, which I believe is an invasive species. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, to my knowledge, I don't think uh, monarchs will use dog strangling vine. Actually, yeah, no, it is a, a bit of a concern because they, they, I think the adults do think it is a milkweed species that they will lay on, but I don't think the caterpillars grow well or properly on it. So it actually is a problem from one is, is an invasive species, yes, and it does take over, but two, it's kind of lures monarchs to it and then the caterpillars don't reproduce or don't, um, don't grow properly. Um, so yeah, it's, it's invasive species is a whole, whole other presentation essentially and, and difficulty to deal with for real. Awesome. Um, if, this is just a little self promo, but if anyone is interested in invasive species, we had a webinar a few weeks ago that's on the Cubes YouTube channel. So you can give a, take a look at that. Um, but I think we'll move on to the rest of the presentation. So thank you, James. Great, my pleasure. All right, so this has been a good segue into what, uh, this iNaturalist. Um, so for those that don't know iNaturalist, um, there's, iNaturalist there's a Canadian version. So iNaturalist is a platform which allows people to take a picture, kind of like tried to kind of capture how it works on this slide. Um, so you take a picture of something you see in the wild through the iNaturalist app or with a digital camera and then you upload it to iNaturalist.ca. It then plots this observation on a map. And this map is now a database of, right now, over 3 million observations in Canada of, of over 28,000 different species. So it's a database in real time. It's growing by the minute as people report things and find new things. Um, and it's an accessible one that can be used for conservation. Um, with that, maybe before I talk too much more about it, I'm going to play a... Um, 
video that we put together that kind of explains the gist of iNaturalist um, and give you a break from me, but it's going to be me talking in the video. So here you go. <laughs> You can help make a difference for wildlife conservation by building a living record of where species you encounter are found and adding to a growing database of our biodiversity. Every photo of a plant, animal, fungus, or track and sound recording you make through iNaturalist Canada can be used to locate species at risk, track invasive species, locate hotspots for wildlife road mortality, rediscover species that were once thought extinct, and much more. You don't need to be an expert to join our naturalist. Everyone is welcome to join in. Starting from your first observation, an auto identification will instantly make species suggestions for you of what you just photographed. The best part is that after making an observation, there are species experts that will help identify the species you love. See what others have posted in your area and get to know what's living around you. It's more than an app, it's an online community. It's not all about taking pictures or sound recordings. You can engage with experts and gain insightful information on species you're observing. You can follow friends to see what they're logging and even message each other through the platform. Look for cool projects to join. Interested in turtles? There's a project for that. What about birds you see at your feeder? Or all things living in a particular area of your city? Start recording observations through the free iNaturalist app or online at iNaturalist.ca. You never know, you could find new species never before seen in Canada, like the painted hen mudbug. Get to know what's living around you. Join iNaturalist Canada today. So hopefully that captured it well and gets to the gist of what this is. So it is basically a database, a platform um, that you can upload your observations if you're on a walk in your down in your city, if you're going for a hike, um, going for a paddle out on the on the lake, um, that you can use the app or a digital camera and record what you see. Um, as I mentioned earlier, so this platform, a partner on iNaturalist Canada, so Canadian Wildlife Federation has been the lead on the creation of the Canadian version of this. It ties to a global network um, that originated in the US, but uh, now there's about 12 different countries with their own iterations like we do have in Canada, and a few more are coming on board. So it's growing um, kind of by the month. Um, but in Canada, um, we have the part, one of our partners is NatureServe Canada, as well as Parks Canada, and the Royal Ontario Museum. So NatureServe Canada has affiliations with all of the provincial conservation data centers, which in Ontario is the Natural Heritage Information Center. And these are the organizations who house all the data on species at risk. So when um, the committee that's determining whether a species is at risk um, is making their decision, they consult these conservation data centers and they will then be able to have access to the iNaturalist data for species at risk that they're looking to um, have, make an assessment on. So this information is going to a valuable place for conservation decisions. Um, and I'm gonna give another example of how we've, CWF has used the, um, the data as far as um, uh, use for conservation. And it goes beyond just, just conservation use, which I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit as well. Um, so if you remember this map that we, we actually did talk about just in the questions, um, uh, if you look at the, the concentrations of species at risk again, um, and the, the, on the right are the concentrations of iNaturalist observations in Canada. Um, so those darker orange areas are where more observations have been made from. Again, they kind of line up with where the um, species at risk uh, are located in, in the country. So it's, it provides them, it just shows that there's an opportunity for where people are, we can um, contribute to uh, recording of these uh, species at risk as well. Um, so when we were using this information, as I remember I was talking about critical habitat um, and protect areas for species at risk, um, we can take an observation from a naturalist, say it's found outside of that critical habitat. Well, 
um, this provides an opportunity to inform this recovery strategy that I talked about earlier to update potentially the critical habitat if it fits the right descriptions um, into areas that could now be protected for uh, a given species at risk. And we just were working with a, uh, a couple of graduate students at uh, the University of British Columbia to undertake this kind of uh, exercise to see if the iNaturalist data could actually pull out and use some of the occurrence information to help um, identify areas of potential uh, new critical habitat, uh, which they did find. And there's, it's more of a test to see if it's doable and, and we can build on that from there. Um, so beyond the information just kind of going one way into conservation, um, there's another way for all of us to benefit from iNaturalist. Um, and it's to kind of have an idea of what's around um, uh, around us, around our neighborhoods, or maybe when we're going for a hike or a camp trip to kind of browse through to see what, what might I come across while in there. So you can use the filters button and search for a specific area or a species group, um, or even a date or year that something was observed. Enter that into your search, and it brings up a bunch of observations from a given area. You can then click on the observation, and it brings you to the species page of the uh, of the actual observation itself. And you could read more if someone put some notes in there. Um, you could read more about the, the observation itself. So there's one thing to use it. Um, one another way to use it is to to kind of learn about what's living around your neighborhood or where you're where you're planning to go. Another thing that is used for besides learning what's around is you can learn what you've just found. So that video that I was just that I showed earlier did talk about this. So there's an image recognition software. So um, in the app and on the uh, website on iNaturals.ca, um, this feature is built into it. And if you're using the app, you'd have to have a, an internet connection for this to use. The app itself works offline. Um, so you can go anywhere with it um, and it'll store the information on your phone. Um, and then you, it'll sync up when you get back to um, internet connection. Um, but to be able to use the image recognition, uh, it, the auto ID feature has to be, uh, you'd have to be at an internet connection. Um, apologies, I hope nobody's too squeamish about snakes. <laughs> um, I should mention the way it works. So the app, um, you, you, uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, you open it up, you tap, there's a button to tap observe. You take a picture of what you're trying to record. Um, the app will automatically pull the location and the time off of your phone and add it into the observation. And then uh, you can write a note in if you like. And then um, once you save it and upload it, it just becomes part of the um, iNaturalist database. And it also becomes part of your own personal list that you can keep track of. So you can go back and see all the observations you've made over time and search back if you were like, oh, I was out camping two years ago and I remember seeing this, this species and I'd like to see what it is again. You can go back and, and search for it as well. Um, so the image recognition software, once you um, have your photo in there, it looks at the picture, it tries to figure out what it is, and it provides a species name. Um, you can select that species um, and uh, it'll, it'll add the species in. If you don't want to use this, you can just write the species in yourself if you know what it is. If you don't know, you can just leave it blank. Um, and then the, other, the next step is that there's people in the community that can help identify it. So of all the people that are on iNaturalist um, can see this observation and help uh, identify it for you. So here's a good example of the same snake and this is an, a real uh, observation in iNaturalist. The observer thought it was a gray rat snake um, and um, here's all the kind of back and forth that the species experts or other people on iNaturalist have um, suggested and in the end, yes, everybody did agree, but there was a lot, enough dialogue around it to say, here's why I think it's this and this. Um, and in the end, the image recognition software did get it as the first um, suggestion that it provided. So the image recognition, the auto ID feature is really good. Um, I gotta say, I've tried to stump it a few times and like even to pick out the species out of the photo itself um, to see that there's something there is one thing, but then to be able to identify it, uh, it's, it's pretty good and it works. Obviously, for some species better than others, for more obscure insects, uh, I wouldn't um, assume it's going to get it perfectly, um, but for other things, it, it can work quite well. Um, there's been some stats run on it as well, and uh, 
I think they figured out about 85% of the time, the, tr the actual species is within that list that shows up um, as a suggestion. And I think 75% of the time it's the first one. So it's, it's pretty good and it's getting better all the time as they run new, um, new algorithms on it to, to try and improve it. Um, I should mention as well, there's the, there's the, the community on iNaturalist, so there's iNaturalist Canada, but as I mentioned, it ties into the global database. Um, all of the members of the global database, which are, there's over 800,000, um, can weigh in on this observation to help identify. So there's a really big network of people um, that can help out. Um, and so this information, as I mentioned, can, can go into this database and be used for conservation decisions. So this kind of ties back into um, what we can do. And I'm gonna kind of tile, tile a bunch of these together uh, as a last slide. To, uh, to leave you with some thoughts of, of next things we can, we can all do for conservation. Um, so as I mentioned with the bats, um, we can um, build or buy a bat box to install and, and keep and uh, monitor it. And we've created, as now that everybody knows about iNaturalist, we've created a project within iNaturalist that is called Help the Bats that um, we're using as our kind of data um, submission sheets so people can go to iNaturalist, they add their bat box and um, fill out the, the data fields like all the all the information we're looking for when it comes to monitoring. And we've created a, I said a monitoring protocol, but we've also created a guide on how to go through and add your observations specifically within iNaturalist and how to, how to do that, like the steps of click here, click here, here's what you add, um, just to help people along. Um, and again, I mentioned, you know, pesticides, um, if we can avoid them altogether, it's better. Um, also think about if bats are in a building, um, how to coexist or at least properly manage them so we're not um, further causing further declines to bat populations. For turtles, um, we all know now, road mortality is a big thing. Um, we actually we have a, a, a great video on our website at helptheturtles.ca on how to move a turtle, and specifically this one is a snapping turtle, um, across the road safely for um, the snapping turtles can get quite large and get slightly aggressive if you're trying to pick one up. Um, so we have a video on, on kind of how to do that safely. And try not to hit turtles. <laughs> um, I know uh, driving at high speeds, a small turtle may be hard to see, but um, if we're aware, especially driving near wetlands, um, keep an eye out on the roads and, you know, obviously don't swerve into oncoming traffic, but um, if, if everyone's paying attention and can slow down enough to make sure that uh, we're not adding to the mortality of turtles on roads. And again, if we're moving turtles off roads, of course, the first thing to think of is your own personal safety and don't do it if it's too dangerous. Um, tying in when I was talking about the, the kind of the large habitat restoration, um, it can be done on any scale. We can think of converting some of our um, of our yard space into pollinator gardens. Um, we have this campaign we're calling Grow It, Don't Mow It um, to allow um, more pollinator uh, habitat. And as much as possible, think about planting native species. Um, they, these are ones that you know, our native pollinators have evolved over you know, thousands of years with. Um, they're better for um, planting around as much as possible. And I know it's not gonna be 100% native species, but as much as we can. Uh, we've got a great re resource on um, CWF's website. This is the Native Plant Encyclopedia. So you could actually search up a bunch of native species and get a bit of information about them and where they grow and kind of how to, how to grow them. And lastly, as we were just talking about, um, think of, of bringing your smartphone out uh, while you're on your next hike. I know I'm not keen on having our face in a device while we're out in nature, but um, at the same time, it also actually gives us another reason to pause and kind of look at what we're walking by instead of walking right by it. So it's a bit of a, a balancing act, I'd say. But um, it's also a tool to learn about what, uh, what it is living around you with the auto ID feature and um, contributing to a, a growing database that, um, that we're using for um, conservation work. Um, so that's where I was going to leave it at with this last slide of a few things we can consider and think about and I'm happy to take any questions.
Thank you so much, James. That was a really insightful presentation. So I know I've learned a lot from you, so thank you. Um, Thanks. Any questions? Um, someone was wondering how, if you have to be close to the image to get a photo for iNaturalist, I'm wondering if that means close to the species. Yeah, that's a good, it is a good question. Um, generally, and we're actually, we're putting together with like the video I show, we're putting together a new, a new video, um, hopefully to come out soon on how to take better photos that are more identifiable, not better visually necessarily, but better ID features. And one of the main things is yes, get as, as close as you can obviously within safe distance, if it's depending on the wildlife. Um, often smartphones aren't ideal for that. So I often will bring my digital camera with a zoom and I'll use that for my photo while I'm out and about so I can use a zoom. Um, and it also has a macro so you can get better images that way. Um, and then I add that image to the website after the fact. Um, the tricky part of there though, is you have to remember where you were because you, you basically can pick a point on a map once you've uploaded your digital photo and it's the same way you would kind of bring a picture into your computer. You kind of drag and drop or go through the browser. Um, but the, another option, which I have to do is I'll take um, the observation with my smartphone, with the app, take a photo as well. And then I just add the photo to the observation later because that way I can kind of have the benefit of the GPS location of my phone and uh, add, add the better picture afterwards. Awesome, thank you. Um, someone was just mentioning how impressed they are with how much an iNaturalist has improved over the years. So great work if that is always you. Um, and someone else was mentioning um, how many injured turtles they see from Southern Ontario and, and especially in Peterborough, um, which is unfortunate. And then someone else is wondering if the Canadian Wildlife Federation works mostly in the Ottawa area or in Ontario or how widespread it is. Yeah, I'm all great. Um, yeah, for one, the iNaturalist, the, the, I'm, I'm impressed with how it's taken off to the, uh, the like growth of number of observations over the years has, has literally been exponential. It's still climbing. Like we, we hit, we were excited last summer to hit 1 million observations all of a sudden in the, in the beginning of the summer. And before the end of the summer, we'd already doubled to 2 million and now we're up over 3 million. So it's, it's, it has grown kind of in and of itself, I think, which is amazing. Um, as far as our work goes, we, we're a national organization. Um, a lot of our terrestrial stuff is, tends to be in Ontario um, because our, our office and our field staff are physically located uh, in Ottawa. Um, so our turtle project is around the Ottawa area. We're partnering with Scales, who's uh, in Muskoka, kind of greater area around there. Um, so yeah, we, we do have a national reach. Like our marine program is east and west coast and we have a, a really large fish passage like barriers to fish movement uh, removal in going on in BC right now to try and remove um, basically culverts that are not passable by fish and dams and stuff like that, that we can kind of increase the, the, the pathways for fish. Cool. Um, someone else is wondering what volunteer opportunities are there with CWF for students and then how to get a career with CWF. <laughs> Good question. We do get a lot of requests for volunteers. Um, our field work is kind of the most interesting, I'd say, um, but it kind of requires some specialized skill. So the volunteers we take on here and there, um, but uh, we honestly don't have a lot. I'm just trying to think of how we can get, how we could engage people. I mean, there, there's, there's some of the field work. I mean, I, I would say just kind of can connect with me or um, we have a, an info line at CWF info. Um, you can send your, your, your interest that way. Um, we also have the Canadian Conservation Corps, which is a kind of youth engagement program, um, which uh, targets youth, I think 15, between 15 and 30. Um, and it's um, a program that anybody can apply to to get in and essentially provides I think it's about a well it's three stints almost about a, a year's worth of experience of like learning um, the conservation world we set you up and, and kind of um, uh, your house at a placement with a partner either CWF or other organizations we're partnering with across the country um, and then the third stage would be kind of going back to your home community and doing like kind of a community project for conservation. So that's like an excellent way for youth to get involved. And um, the other part of it is it pays the person's expense. So like food and, and lodging and all that is paid for during the year. It's not paid work, but it's volunteering with no expenses. So. 
That sounds, that sounds really cool. Mm -hmm. um, someone else was wondering if there are any helpful non-native plants that can be left in a habitat. Um, they noticed that their bees are feeding on some introduced species like the St. John's wort and herb, herb robert. Um, but they do understand that it's important to remove invasives like scotch broom and Himalayan blackberry. Yeah, yeah, I would totally agree. And that's why I kind of said as much as possible native. Um, I have the same in my yard. I've got some non-natives as well. I'm trying as much as I can to, to increase the native species. Um, not the non-native species are always bad. Um, the concern would be kind of the more invasive non-natives um, and them getting out of hand. So, I mean, if they're kept in check, uh, you know, they are still providing a benefit. I wouldn't say, you know, it's better to have that than no pollination or no flowers for pollinators. So, you know, I, I wouldn't go and say, um, you know, reprimand someone for not having native plants by any means. So um, I think it's all good. Uh, just make sure to, that they're kept in check. Um, I think a, 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 a main source of our, na our invasive species are ornamental garden plants. Unfortunately, it's people that have brought them in and they're nice and they reproduce well and fill up the garden, um, but then they get, a, they get away from us. Um, I think that was all the questions I had, but I just had another comment saying that someone was able to collect monarch caterpillars and keep them in an enclosure on milkweed until they turn into butterflies um, and were able to save about 10 and then release them into the wild. So that's really cool. Awesome. Go you. Yeah. And I've done that with my kids a, a few times too, and it's it's great. You get to see them, you know, uh, develop and release them, and it's yeah, it's it's a great a great way too to engage, especially young kids, in conservation and and see what you know what we can do to help species. Mm -hmm. Awesome, that sounds really cool. Um, yeah. Someone else was mentioning that species specific pollinators. Um, for species specific pollinators, the native plants are essential. But again, as you mentioned, um, if there are there's also beneficial non-native plants that aren't invasive, so they're just in agreement with you. Um, mm -hmm. And then someone else is nine years old and is an environmental activist and is wondering how they can help. That's great. Um, honestly, we have an education program, which kind of, I mean, for one is to inspire and, and teach kids about um, conservation, but a lot of it is in the hopes that the kids bring that home and, and educate their parents. So, um, I'd say, honestly, you know, talk to your friends about things when you see um, someone doing something that's maybe not as beneficial to conservation or, you know, harming a species or, you know, whatever to, to just, you know, make, uh, make a point of, of saying it. Um, and honestly, uh, it's a good reminder to adults that kids can, can say, speak up and say something. And if we see a turtle on the road to be like, hey, you know, that, that turtle's endangered, we can, we can help that. Um, so I think that's a, that's a big role that kids can play. Mm -hmm. For sure. That's all the questions I have. So I just wanted to thank you again for taking your Thursday night um, to, to spend with us and to educate us. Again, I said I learned a lot um, and we really appreciate having you here. So thank you. Oh, thank you so much. It was my pleasure. Awesome. All right. That's the end of the presentation. Have a good night, everyone. Bye, everyone.